This is a geek leader. Hey, Geek Leaders. Welcome to episode 153 of Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauda, and I want to thank our sponsor, Splashtop. So we're in the midst of COVID-19, where a lot of people are locked down, especially in the United States. And when we're locked down, that means we can't go to work physically, or we can't physically be at the computers that we need to work on. So luckily, we have a program like Splashtop that can be installed on those machines, and then we can remotely access them from anywhere. You can remotely access PCs or Macs or Linux machines from iPads, iPhones, laptops, desktops. It doesn't matter. You can access them from pretty much anything Thing, and they work great. You can set different frame rates. You can have like 30 frames per second for, for better uh, performance. If you have good high-speed internet at your house and good internet from where you're coming from, they work fantastic. And maybe you don't have great internet. Well, that's okay. You can dial back some of the settings. You can reduce some of the uh, um, the frame rates. You can reduce certain settings to make the performance even better. So it's a fantastic product with lots of little features and lots of things. You can get the Business Pro, so you can have multiple monitors streamed too. Excellent product, excellent services, excellent customer support too. So check it out. Go to geekleader.com slash splashtop for a free trial and 20% off your order. Again, that's geekleader.com slash splashtop. Hey, Geek Leaders. Today on the show, we've got John Hitler. You may remember him from a previous episode where we talked about his book, The Motivation Trap. And today we've got um, a new topic to talk about. We're going to talk about you know, finding your genius talent. We talked a little bit about genius talent the last time. We kind of teased it, but I've gone through the process now, and there's a book coming out called One in a Billion where John's going to go through this in a little bit more details. But we're going to talk about that today and also kind of how knowing what your genius talent is and, and you know what is a genius talent and how that will affect leadership and make you a better leader. Uh, John, welcome back to the show. Thank you. I'm a repeat offender, which is a title that usually usually tails me in other, other circles. <laughs> Hopefully not too bad. No, um, not too bad. For anybody that may not have caught the first episode, because we ha- have had you know a substantial growth since then, t- talk a little bit about kind of your past and what you do and how you got to where you are, uh, you know, just to lay some context for our conversation. Sure. So the short version is I'm, I'm really an entrepreneur and a, and a CEO type. I've started, I founded nine companies and a private foundation um, the last company that I founded, uh, was a coaching company and I came on to scale it really. I was supposed to be the revenue guy. And as it turns out, coaching and transformation and change is really good fit for my genius talent. So I fell in love with the coaching piece and I've done quite well with it. People said, wow, you, you're naturally a good coach. Perfect. Um, so I've, uh, I got out of all of the, I didn't have nine businesses at one time, but I always had one with, that was a cash cow for like 30 years, but it was a boring business. It was profitable, but boring. So what I would do as a board entrepreneur is I'd go start something ridiculously you know, improbable and non-profitable and, uh, and push my energy there. It's nice to be out of all that and just coaching. So, uh, so I'm what's called a transformational business coach. Essentially what I do is take founder led and venture backed CEOs and what they don't realize the, the problem within the problem, they can't scale their company as fast as they want to because their growth as a CEO is, is slowing it down and they can't see it. They have to scale their own ability as a CEO because they're still running a 150 person company the same way they were when it was 10 and right. it won't work. It won't. And so the, the company of course, stalls out and they can't figure it out. They think it's a revenue thing or a management thing or a lead. No, it's a, it's a growth thing for the CEO. So, hmm. so um, now we talked last time mostly about your, your book, The Motivation Trap. Give us a quick uh, five minute update about what that is. So that in case we have some, some pieces that bleed over from this conversation, you know, people, people are aware of what, what, what that book was about. And uh, kind sure. Of sure. It's not, you know, I won't give you the five minute. I'll give you the 30 seconds. Perfect. It's a full indictment of the overuse of motivation. Um, and usually by leaders or team leaders. And here's what it, what it came to when I would, when I would talk to CEOs and say, what's your biggest challenge? One of them kept coming up. CEOs would say, I just can't keep John Rauda motivated every day. And literally I wanted to puke on their shoes. <laughs> Cause I said, why are, wait a minute, isn't John contracted and he's, you know, uh, doesn't he have a job there to do? Why are you in charge of motivating? Kind of like trying to motivate your kids to do their homework every day. Why, if you'd sign up for that, by about three weeks into school, you're screwed because there's only so many things you can do to motivate your kids to do homework that they don't want to do. 
same with employees. And so it, it gave an energetic and strategic methodology for doing everything more effective than trying to motivate people on a, on a daily basis. Because uh, CEOs trying to, or team leaders trying to motivate people every day is an absolutely exhausting and losing game. And what happened uh, with most of these, and they didn't see it, they weren't doing their real job because what they were trying to do is get people to do their work by some form of heady motivation or manip it really turned into manipulation. Not a very powerful way to run a company. And of course, they'd stall out. So that's what the book's about. It's, it's not a mean-spirited book. It essentially gives that argument in chapter one and then says, why don't we try something else? Here's about 15 other ways to do it. And here's where motivation really does fit in. Motivation does have a role, but it's very small. Yeah, and uh, when you got you and I talked after we got off the the podcast, I came back to you for um, this you know genius talent assessment, and we went through that that process. And one of the things that um, was helpful for me was to figure out what actually motivated me and uh, gave me purpose. And that was that was kind of what what I got out of the process. Uh, what do you find people get when they go through this um, genius talent assessment? Yeah, it's, it's odd that what they think is they're going to get the answer to, you know, what I do great and, and, and what not, and they do. Where most people start is with defense. Mm -hmm. And the question we'll ask them after they find it uh, is what should you stop doing? Like it's an insult to who you are as a human being. It's not an insult to humanity, but think of like um, kids are the best place to do it. If you, have, if you have kids, especially more than one, one of them probably is the kid that can take a million piece Lego set they take the instructions or the maps and throw them away and they can create 17 different amazing structures with no instructions and they do it all day every day well don't have that don't have that guy do stuff that isn't connected to that level of play and thinking and then there's another one that needs the map doesn't find legos that interesting because they they try to build the the star wars spaceship and they can't quite figure it out and it's frustrating doesn't mean they won't play Legos, but they're not they're not wired to do it that way. Hmm. So for most people, where they where they start is to say, "Oh my God, I got to stop! I got to get rid of anything having to do with the opposite of my genius talent." And the reason you do that, if you think of your energy like a like a triangle or a pyramid, think of it like a pyramid. Mm -hmm. The bottom third, which is about sixty percent of your energy, generally gets wasted on stuff you're just not wired to do. So when you stop doing that, what you end up doing is freeing up all of that time and energy, and guess what? It gets reinvested, or it has the possibility to get reinvested in things you're naturally wired to do. So that's when we really have fun, is when people dump the stuff they're terrible at. And and really, it's not just that they're terrible, it's that it robs them of their energy. Then they really start to transform, because they say, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm having so much more fun now, because I stopped paying the bills, I stopped cutting the grass, I stopped... Um, meal planning or whatever it is for you uh, that robs your energy, they say, oh, it's not that hard to get rid of. No, it's not. It's, it's somehow we have it wired that because I own a house, I should do home repairs. No, home repairs are going to have to get done, just not by me. And when I realized, oh, stop, stop doing those, my life got infinitely easier, simpler, because I stopped wrecking Saturdays with trying to do home repairs that I was terrible at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know when um, – I don't know if it was with our second kid or third kid. One of our kids, when they were born, we made a decision to, you know, not do these big, massive landscaping projects ourselves, and let's get someone else in to do them. And you know, once we got out of that and freed up so much time, of of you know, I still I still cut the grass myself because I like that you know that thirty minutes or forty five minutes of solitude, listening to a podcast or an audio book yeah. or something like that. But right. the the other projects, you know, the mulching myself and everything else, I I, I gave that away. It eventually becomes manual labor, and you give up time with your kids and your family. Exactly. <laughs> swinging a pick and digging holes. And you I say, if you love that, because some people say, man, I, I just had the best Saturday. I worked in the yard all day. Not me. That's not a good Saturday for me. Yeah, because you know? everybody's different. And once you find that, yep. it, what, I, what I found that it was, I was doing is like I was paying the 50 bucks you know, a, a week or whatever it was to, to spend time with my kids. And that's, that's worth it. You know? mm -hmm. It's the same at work. You, know, you hire somebody to do all the stuff that you're terrible at, and guess what? You hire somebody that loves to do that. I, I, I'll give you a quick story. We had a—I still have her. She's a bookkeeper, but she's a CPA who 
backed away from being a CPA when she had kids because she wanted to stay home. So what she does is she runs a high-end bookkeeping service and gets everything ready for the CPA. So she saves you a ton of money because she charges you 50 bucks an hour instead of a CPA's rate. Great. She called me one morning and said, uh, this is about three years ago, and she was balancing for the year, and she was like $7.26 off for the year on all the revenue we had run through three different businesses that were all merged under one um, LLC. And she called me on Monday and said, or she called me on Friday and said, I'm really, perple- I, I'm going to, I will, I promise you, I will find this. And in my head, I'm going $7 and 26 cents. Why wouldn't you just put in a miscellaneous expense like office supplies balance and be done? Yeah. And <laughs> Here, I'll give you 10 bucks. Let's call it a day. <laughs> she could not do it because it was not congruent. And she called me Monday and said, I want to tell you, I found it. It took me all weekend. And what I really want to tell you, it was my mistake. I'm not going to charge you. It was really interesting. And she started telling me the story about how she found a $7.26 mistake, which I could have cared less about. But for her, the way she's wired, this was like a five-dimensional puzzle, and she needed to solve it, and she loved it. It was like she was on the train. She was like Sherlock Holmes for $7.26, and I'm going, this lady's nuts. Now, she's nuts like, um, as a friend of mine calls genius talent. He kids me about it. He said, so this is like the thing you're like an idiot savant. Like you can't not do it. I said, <laughs> I said that's, that's a funny way to say it. But she loved the, the – and I bet she didn't sleep all weekend. And and she just – and then Monday she was so relieved and so happy and had to tell me the story. And I said, I could have cared less. Except that I'm glad that person is doing my books because I never have to worry about being audited or whatnot because she's unbelievably well-suited for what she does – I would have just, you and I would have just said, yeah, uh, miscellaneous or office expense <laughs> or anything. We wouldn't have gotten audited over a $7.26. So we would have just said, let's balance the darn thing out. No, nope, she couldn't do it. Good. I used to do my own books. Why was I doing the books when you get somebody like that that's perfectly suited and plays? She does not work at it. She plays at it. For her, it's just play. And I think, man, not me. Just not me. So would you would you recommend that leaders maybe hire – um, their opposites or um, – because I found that a lot of people would hire they, – they try to hire themselves. They try to hire someone just like them um, in order to scale. But when I, whenever I've tried to do that, um, it doesn't really work out very well. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts? What are your experience tell you when it comes to that? Sure. The last thing you need is a second CEO. You don't need a co-CEO. So what you really need is somebody that's, that's a ninja with your calendar, a ninja with your organization. Wherever you're not very good – um, the tricky part is there can be conflict there because you say, I'm willing to make it up or figure it out or what, and they are super um, organized and, if you will, linear. They, they measure twice, cut once, they, they're super. It, it may look to you like they're slow in terms of getting stuff done. And what you'll notice after about a month is you say, you know what, we never have to redo anything that my admin does because they're so good and methodical and, and they measure twice and cut once. I don't measure. I eyeball it and then I cut it and then we waste we waste stuff because I go by, if, if that's true. Good. So you're going to want somebody that's got complementary or perhaps oppos- oppositional skills and then you're going to have to have some bridge on communication because they may drive you nuts. You know, they may look like they're too methodical or too slow. It's fine. They'll protect you like crazy. Hmm. Uh, that's usually a good match. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I know when I, when I, whenever I, you know, work with different people that are, that are different than, than I am, they think differently. A lot of times, I get into that trap of, of trying to see things from their perspective, but not being able to because I, clud- I clutter with my own judgments, my own yeah. history, and my own past. Do you have any advice for helping empathy or empathize with with folks and understand their perspective? Because that's one of the things that, you know, I still struggle with. It's interesting. Rather than empathy, because you you can learn. You know, we all have a, a you know, if we have a, on a scale, let's say, on a one to hundred, you may be a ninety nine on empathy. You may be a three on empathy. What I find is more um, effective is gratitude, where I'm grateful for the work they do that protects me, because then I don't have to understand it all mm-hmm. or empathize with it. I just say oh, I'm so glad that my in my case I have a scheduler. Because people say, oh, can I move this 45 minutes and I'll move it and not realize that my 
measure twice, cut once admin who does my scheduling factored in travel time and I didn't. Mm-hmm. Ah, so I move at 45 minutes because it looks like it's free on my calendar and she's she's always four steps ahead of me with that and I'll look like I've got a gap on my account. So I'm grateful for the, gratitude's easier for me than trying to empathize because sometimes I really can jam it in. I could figure it out, I can add an extra call or I can add an extra client or whatnot. And so if I empathized and um, teamed with that level of thinking, I might get less done, but I am very grateful for most days for me are not terribly stressful because she's put in the margins that really help. And you go, and so I find gratitude is just easier for me than empathy because I just don't because there are days when it looks like it's moving too slowly. Yeah, I haven't I haven't applied gratitude to that. I know um, I had AJ Jacobs on a while back and we talked a lot about gratitude. He wrote the book uh, Thousand Thank Yous. And sure. uh, one of the tips he had was to um, go through the alphabet, you know, at the end of the day. And for every letter of the alphabet, think of something that you're grateful for, you know. Oh, what a great exercise. And uh, he said he usually lays in bed and does that and goes to sleep by the time he gets to like G. <laughs> yeah, you, you, but, yeah, like me, you're just over, overflowing with gratitude. Yeah, yeah but it, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing because I was going through the, thing, the idea of, you know, let me think of three things that I'm grateful for um, every evening that happened that day and, and make them unique. Don't be, you know, I'm grateful for my kids. Oh, that's boring. And, yeah, my health, yeah. my kids, and my house. Yeah, it's yeah, like well, a great sure enough. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's um, funny. That's funny. So, uh, it, tell folks um, what is a genius talent because that, that's something that you know we, we hit on a little bit last time we've, we've bounced around it this time but what would you say how would you define genius talent sure so the, so the word we found is that genius scares people it they does. think of genius uh, a lot in terms of math and science or music like prodigies and it's it's not that at all it's uh, the way we describe it is that it's a theory it's in your DNA. So you don't get a choice either by genetic lottery or by a, a supreme being. You were gifted a, a talent that's in every cell in your body. And it could be anything. Now, it's a talent, not a profession. That's a big mistake people make. They say, well, I'm an accountant. I, I'm, my genius talent is numbers. And you say, you know what? There's a gazillion accountants that work with numbers. You can't be the only one on the planet that holds you know, I think of somebody that's gifted with numbers where they can multiply seven figures in their head uh, times four numbers. And you say, that's somebody who's gifted with numbers. That's a genius talent with numbers. You're good with a 10 key. That's a skill. Genius talent is, uh, it's got three parts. It's the gift of talent you got, and you've done the process. So mm-hmm. you put the overlay of talent and you say, that's not by itself unique, but it's rare. The part that makes it unique is that you were given a gift and probably intuitively your whole life, you figured out a way to deliver it that looks like a delivery, uh, like a step-by-step delivery process. So you combine a really high-level talent with the way that you've figured out how to bring it forth in the world, and then the driver for the whole thing is your why. And we've done a lot of work on why. We've worked extensively with Simon Sinek. Uh, in the early days of him developing why, a why is just a belief. But when your belief fuels your talent, it's a dynamic combination because you get up all day, every day, and do it because your talent and your purpose are now in perfect alignment. Mm -hmm. If they're not, then your genius talent uh, won't have much power because they're, they're not connected. So For for instance, my genius talent is creating seemingly impossible outcomes. I'll I'll leave it at that. There's there's a longer version. But people say, that's a weird thing. I've never seen that on a standardized test. Well, I don't, like you and everybody else, I don't have a standardized genius. (laughs) It is what I got. So I create seemingly impossible outcomes. Well, my why, skip the how I deliver it. The why is, and I believed it for a long time, is that I believe that when we play boldly together, Everyone wins big. So you just combine the two and you say, huh, I create seemingly impossible outcomes. I do this because I believe that when we play boldly together, everyone wins big. Do the two fuel each other? You say, yeah, they're hand in glove. That's where the power of a, of a genius talent statement comes through. It's, it's your highest level talent, how you deliver it. 
and your purpose, literally your purpose on earth. So when people ask me, I'll get questions. I'll say, well, I got, a, I got a little project I need. I'm, I heard you're really good at solving problems. They think I'm a problem solver. Mm-hmm. Oh, I heard you're really good at solving. I got a little project I need some help with. As soon as they say the word little, my brain shuts off and I, I'm out. And I say, oh, gosh, I'd love to help you, but I'm booked for the next six months. I don't even know if the little project is uh, clean water for the entire planet. They, that may be their little project, and I don't let them even get it out of their mouth because the word little doesn't play in my ecosystem. I, I like winning big, and I like playing boldly. So if they want timid or little, I'm out. I just don't do those. And it's not that I'm a bad guy. I know I'm no good if what we're going to be is methodical or timid or cautious and or solve a little problem. I'm no good. We're fine. There are people that are really good at, at methodically solving problems. That's not me. Okay, good. So that's what it ends up looking like is you, you discover or you uncover. We don't think you discover it because it's not it's not Because it's, it's DNA, right? It's there all along. Yeah, it's, but for most of us, if you, if you take your hand and open it up like, like the palm and put it right up against your nose, for most people, that's where it's at. It's, it's so close because it's part of your DNA, they can't see it. And all we do in the process is pull your hand about 18 inches away from you, and then you can see it in full view. And, and people say, oh, my gosh, how did you know we didn't? All we do is run you through a frame or a process, and it shows up in your language, not mine. We don't tell people what their genius talent is. They tell us. We tease it out of them. And that's why the process is kind of powerful, because for the first time, they've seen themselves in a different view. And and the talent can be anything. It's not because uh, people think of it like a profession, like there's only so many professions. It's not. It's a talent. So you use it with your spouse, you do it with your kids, you'll use it in your volunteer work, you use it in your play or your free time. And of course, if you use it professionally, it's, you know, in your case, let's say like in your field, there's people that say, well, I'm reading, I'm reading a Wall Street Journal or uh, sorry, a New York Times bestselling book on leadership. Mm-hmm. It's, it's somebody's version of what a dynamic leader should be. Is it, does it pertain to you? Because you only have one genius talent. And let's say you're empathetic. You shouldn't be a charismatic, uh, um, bold, like big personality type leader. You should be an empathetic leader and you will be unbelievable. But you're not going to be good using someone else's recipe because that's just not who you are. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's that's, – I think it's really interesting the way you put that you are not just discovering it, you're you're kind of uncovering something that's already there. It's already and it's, there. And it's been there the whole time. It's been there the whole time. And of course our school system doesn't and I'm it's not a knock on the school system. For social reasons, we do one way, one predominant way to do school. Mm-hmm. We don't tease that out and say, Oh, John is really good at building a model. So when we have to do a project, we should allow him to do a 3D model and tell a story as opposed to somebody who's um, measure twice, cut once, and and very good at asking questions. Good. They should do a written project, and then someone else should do a verbal, like a, like a almost like a performance because different, pe- different people learn and, and, um, and share and create value different ways. School doesn't allow that. And so it, what it does is it gives people the sense that I'm not very good at this. Oh, maybe the system isn't very good at teasing out what you, the way that you express yourself or the way you what I would say the way you create value. So, do you think finding your genius talent helps people like double down on their strengths, or um, or is it more about eliminating their weaknesses, or a little bit of both? Yeah, so, it's not about doubling down. I would say it's exponential, like okay. the third power. Because if if you start eliminating, in in my case, I'll, I'll use myself. In my case, if I'm not creating seemingly impossible outcomes, I'm not very useful. And people say, well, how do you do that all the time? And that's why coaching has been a really good thing. Now what I do is I partner with my clients. And of course, they have what to them looks like impossible outcomes. And they say, can you help me? Absolutely. Now, if what uh, I used to coach at, um, I can't say the name, so I'll, I'll keep it really secret. It's a, t- it's a Fortune 10 software company near seattle uh so i don't want to give it away yeah i have no idea what that could be <laughs> yeah no way to guess that no. um 
But they, I used to go in there and they'd say, well, last year our sales rose 9.4% and that created a stock increase of about 12%. We'd like to go a little bit higher, but not too far, because if we go, if we if we let the governor off and, and raise our profitability or uh, yeah, our, our net profit or sales 20 percent, Wall Street's going to expect it every quarter. We don't want. So can you help us raise our sales by like two percent? And it was just stupid. But from my vantage point, because I'm thinking, why not go for impossible <laughs> or why not go for uh, exponential? And what they were trying to do was set expectations so that they couldn't ever have a bad quarter. And I understand the game, but it's crazy. It's absolutely in my, in my, and that's what they wanted. Cause they said, we heard you're really good at this, that, and the other. So what they wanted was they really wanted me to help them with their weak teams and get them functional so that they could raise their sales by two to two, but not 4%. Because if you go for, Oh my God, well, wall street's going to expect that every quarter. Crazy, absolutely crazy. But crazy by my standards, not by theirs. I totally get the game they were playing. It just wasn't any fun. Yeah, it just wasn't your game. It wasn't my game. And so they had the wrong guy Mm -hmm. because what they needed was somebody who was methodical and could keep them on that pace quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter. And the only way that I can process the world is to say, why don't you guys double every three years or double every two years? Because, of course, they did. They went 100x for the first every year for the first five to seven years. And that's how they became a monstrous behemoth in the, in the, that's how, that's how startups and all that stuff explode. Well, once they got to be mature, they had to start managing expectations and limiting. And you go, Oh boy, Ugh, not much fun. No. Yeah. The whole, the whole market is just, it's confusing to me. It's definitely not my game. I know, <laughs> um, you know, I hear about people complaining about, you know, oh, Netflix didn't grow. It's like, well, that's because everybody already has a subscription. I mean, there, there's no more growth to happen. You know? Right. Where, where's it going to come from? Right. Yeah. And people say the same thing about Facebook. I'm like, well, Facebook has like a billion accounts. You know, they're not going to get any more. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly right. And unless it's going to come from foreign countries and, and they're exploring all that. And so then all they can do is say we need additional products. Well, and then they get sometimes they get in trouble because they say, well, we're going to go into a product line that has nothing to do with us because we've got a we've got a base of a billion people. What if what if 10 percent of them bought our new product? We'd make a fortune. You say, yeah, but you're not in you're not known for that. And nobody trusts you for that. And you're not the best in that. Mm-hmm. You're just trying to jam another product through a distribution network that wasn't meant to do that. If you're Amazon, you can jam almost anything because you think of buying stuff. Regardless, whether it's a subscription or a physical product, the first place people do is, uh, or the first place people go is online and say, "Why would I go to Walmart when I can have this delivered to my house tomorrow and not leave, not leave home?" It's crazy. Uh, it's I'll I'll do that. Yep, um, but that won't work for other companies you know, like Facebook or Netflix. They can't sell a physical product probably because people are going to say, "What does Netflix know about?" Right, and, and, and Facebook tried. You remember they had the uh, the Facebook thing that hooks onto your TV, so you could like. Yep. Yep. They've really tried good. all kinds of different things. Yeah, they tried to go into the TV business mm-hmm. and the streaming mm-hmm. and all. And yeah, not a good because we didn't in our brain we didn't put that together. And there were other people, of course, who did it better than they did. Just because they're big and the talented doesn't mean they should be in every every market. And of course, you lose your shirt doing that kind of stuff. Right. Exactly. Yeah, um, that, that's the problem. So this new book, One in a Billion, I know you and I went through the process, the genius talent process. And and when we went through uncovering my my genius talent, it was like we had to schedule um, a two-hour block. I think it was two hours. Um, It's it's been a while now since we've done it. But a a two-hour block, I think. And then we sat through and and went through it. um, And it took, you know, two people scheduling that. Does your book kind of allow that to be more of an individual process? So what what we've wanted to do since day one is scale it. Mm-hmm. Because that's the only way we've done it up until now is to say, let's schedule a one-on-one. Or sometimes we do it three-on-one because people wanted to do it in small groups. Fine. But then we had to do three calls, two hours each. And and so what we did was we, we, did, we took that three-on-one approach and removed the facilitator. And we put it online and the, we created a web portal that, if you will, is the facilitator. It's got pro tips. It's got, it allows anyone to go through with par- learning partners or we call them commando squad partners um, and create a great result. So they, they can do that now online as of now. 
and the book is the accompaniment. So it's, it's uh, you and I mentioned it before the call, but it's kind of like having a chemistry handbook. What you really want to do is go in the lab and do the experiment and have fun and create something, but you need the handbook to do it. The two go hand in hand, and there's an, on, there's an online web portal that we've beta tested, and people are getting a result. And that's what we wanted all along is that people can, on their own time, without having to be limited by our schedule, they can do this process by themselves and find their genius talent. Our, our theory is if a million people did, uh, did their genius talent and discovered it, we'd solve every major problem in the, on the planet. Because there's somebody out there that doesn't know anything about homelessness, but the way their mind and their heart are wired, they could solve it really well. And what we're doing is we're giving it to people who are quote unquote experts. <sighs> we don't need experts. We need people that really could do it. And it's going to be somebody who's, if you will, quirky in their talent and their talent will fit perfectly to solving homelessness. They, they, they may not even know much about homelessness, but mm -hmm. their talent would fit perfectly to solve it. You say, oh, right. You just got to find those people. How yeah, you so find them? You're not going to find them in the want ads. Yeah. Um, how is it that the um, once you discover your, your genius talent and like how, how do you relate that to what their career should be or and how do you convince someone that, hey, you know, you shouldn't be an accountant anymore. You need to go into sales or, or you know, uh, or something like that. It's a great question. And this is where people think they, they, they blur the lines between talent and profession. Mm. Let's say you're a teacher. Well, there's a gazillion teachers. They don't all teach the same way. And the ones who get frustrated and quit and go into real estate or go into something else say, I couldn't take it, oftentimes for political reasons because the unions and whatnot. But, but if you're forced, uh, the, the question to ask yourself, let's say you're a teacher, is when you teach, what happens for me? Or what happens for your classroom or your audience? And, they, and they'll say something like, oh, well, they see completely unique ways of, of uh, viewing a challenge or an opportunity. Ah, so then what we ask them was we say, so rather than calling yourself a teacher, which is how you talk about yourself, is your genius talent, we just ask them and they tell us, is your t genius talent opening up creative ways for people to view a challenge or an opportunity? And they say, I do that all day. When I'm at my best, I do that all day, every day. And say, ah, that's different than teaching. Because where else could you use that? You could use that in the boardroom. <laughs> what if you saw, you could, you, that's a more applicable talent that it works really well in teaching, but it would work 20 or 30 or 50 other places really well. My guess is you could use that. Think of parenting. You say, huh, what if as a parent, your best talent as a parent is opening up new novel ways or new ways for your kids to view a challenge or an opportunity. Could you coach their soccer team? Yeah. Even if you don't know anything about soccer, you could do that with that talent. You could do it. You say, mm. Oh, that's interesting. You're right. I could, I could, I could volunteer and coach soccer. Not because you're any good at soccer, but you can create or position new ways for six year olds to man, uh, to learn how to play soccer. Oh, you'd be better than the than the you know the little league, if you will, the classic little league dads who want to uh, win every game and, and dominate. You say that's not so helpful in life. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's just positioning it as a talent, and then asking the question: Where else would this be useful? If your talent were something like that, which is really a valuable talent, where would it be useful? Almost anywhere, in almost any. But when you define it as a profession. People say, well, they had a job as a teacher and they they got out of it after three years. I, I don't maybe they weren't a very good teacher. Or maybe they didn't like it. That's the story we create. Society creates it and we create it too. I said I just didn't like uh, I didn't like the ecosystem or I didn't like the kids or I didn't like the parents or I didn't like the union or I didn't like whatever. You say, Yeah, but what if you could have been protected and just did what you did? And the great teachers, you know, the ones you remember when you're 20 years outside of grade school, you still remember. You say, I had this amazing fifth grade teacher who really put time into me. And, and it wasn't about that they could teach you math better. You remember them because they changed your life in a way. And that didn't have anything to do with the subject material they were teaching. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah. And that's the that's where we get to the difference. And uh, it's where society blurs it because they think they especially when they hear genius, you say genius is like, oh, I can't be a genius. I'm not. A, I didn't you know, I didn't do very well on my SATs or I was not a great student. You say it has nothing to do with that. It's uh, genius can be about ways of, of highlighting or showcasing a problem in a way that people can see it clear. Is that academic? No. No, but but you do it off the scale better than anyone, and you could do it with teaching math, even though you don't know anything about math, or teaching uh, six six year olds how to play soccer. It's it's the same talent. Hmm. So your book will be out by the time this 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 airs. Um, you're, it's not about reading the book and just you know reading it like you would any other book. There, there's things you have to do with this book, right? It's a process. Um, could you explain what makes this book a little bit different than just picking up a book off of uh, Amazon and reading through it? Yeah, it, it, you're, you're exactly right. If you read the book, it'd be like reading a book about uh, swimming, but never getting in the water. It, it wouldn't it wouldn't work. So the book is the whole process with stories and examples and uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of genius talent statements from people all over the world that were kind enough to say, sure, you can use mine and put it in the book and showcase um, so that people get a sense of what's possible. That's what the book's about. But eventually you have to, you have to go into the web portal, which is called one in a billion book.com um, and play. And when you go in there, what'll happen is we'll team you up with two other people that are interested in doing the same thing. The weird thing is you won't know. them, <laughs> And there's a reason for that. If you and I are best buddies, I will be either consciously or unconsciously biased about what your talent is, and I'm going to try to prove, even though I don't think I am, I'm going to try to prove that you are what I think you are. When I don't know you, all I can do is rely on the process, and I'm way more unbiased and agnostic, and what we come out with is a cleaner result. So we, we connect people up with two learning partners uh, what they've said, we've done it with the beta testers, and it didn't surprise us a bit, is they said, I feel like after doing the process in a three-person team with a series of conference calls, I feel like I know this person better than I know anyone else on the planet. You say, yeah, because you learned about them through, if you will, their DNA and their talent, and you, you did an intimate process, an int intimate learning process, which is fun. It's, it's a very fun process. You, you get to know them on a on a level other than name, rank, and serial number. Because we do a lot of name, rank, and serial number. You go to a barbecue and people say, oh, where do you, what neighborhood do you live? Oh, how old are your kids? Oh, are you married or not? It's not terribly helpful information, it, we, but we do it, but it's more demographic. Uh, what we really love is when you say, I love hanging out with John because he's funny as hell, or he's he makes a difference in the community, or he's got this charity that he, that he uh, works for that, you know, good for him. That's when we love people. And we don't really care whether their their kids are in third grade or fourth grade or whether, and that's kind of how we, we, we use this superficial vetting and the genius talent goes right to the heart of that. You get, you get to know people at a very, very different level and it's fun. It's very fun. Awesome. So how can people um, pick up the book and learn more about uh, genius talent and connect with you? Sure. So um, the book website is one in a billion book.com uh, I was blessed uh, with what I call the unintended gift of a dirt sandwich we all have those in our life my last name is Hitler so uh, the SEO for that I've never spent a penny I've never hired anybody and I own the first 50 SEO spots because who else is gonna who else is gonna do that there's two T's in it but uh, that'll show our website it'll show the book it'll show the TED talk it'll show everything because it's, there's nobody else that wants the SEO. So that's that's easier for most people to remember. They may not remember one in a book, billion book.com, but they're not going to go home and say, I can't remember the guy's last name. I just, I, <laughs> it's just it's a, you know, for the life of me, I just can't remember. So uh, that's that's where the dirt sandwich has really paid off well at, at later in life. So Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Greatly appreciate it. We'll link all this up in the show notes at geekleader.com, um, as well as we have a page where we uh, put all of the uh, books of our guests, and your book will be featured there as well. So, uh, again, thanks a lot, John. My pleasure. Hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with John Hitler, and definitely check out his book, One in a Billion. It is linked up in the show notes, and it just came out, so it's fresh off the presses. 
And also, don't forget to check out our sponsor, Splashtop. You can get 20% off in a free trial at geekleader.com slash splashtop, and they offer the best in class when it comes to re- remote support for uh, PCs, Macs, Linux, and you can connect from any kind of device, including your iPad, your phone, your tablet, your Chromebook, all kinds of cool stuff going on at Splashtop. So check that out at geekleader.com slash splashtop. 